Hello, and welcome to today's Mindset Podcast. I have Kamini Woods here with me. Um, Kamini, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so just a, a little bit of background. I always love starting with this. Uh, a mother of five, um, that in and of itself is impressive. Um, you're also an international best-selling author, um, certified life coach for teens and adults, board, board certified through the American Association of Drugless Practitioners, um, and as a founder and CEO of Live jo uh, Joy Your Way and the Authentic Me uh, Rise Up program, how do you juggle all of this? I try to do it with a lot of grace and humor. <laughs> <laughs> I guess with so much going on, sometimes you need to uh, take a step back and enjoy what you do. Yes, and also one little caveat, it's not five little children. So my youngest is eight, but my oldest turns 21 in August. So I'm not juggling little children. <laughs> <laughs> fair point. Fair enough. Um, so tell us a little about a little bit about yourself and um, what is it that you do? Because I spent a little bit of time looking at your website and quite frankly, I think it was so extensive and there was so much information that, uh, you know, um, a little bit of clarity would be would be nice. Absolutely. Uh, so I am a professional coach. I work with individuals who feel stuck, trapped, stagnant, whatever the the issue may be. <laughs> where it's about mindset, it's about behaviors, how do we move forward? So how did I even get into this? Well, truth be told, I am a recovering people-pleasing perfectionist. Uh, I spent the first um, about 15 years of my work life um, running different companies, um, running marketing departments, human resources, and really helping the people that I worked with figure out where they wanted to go and what they wanted to accomplish. And once I realized that that was actually my passion, including that I needed to do my own personal work on releasing, <laughs> people -pleasing, releasing the perfectionism, I realized that that was the, the best um, marriage of two things for me. And I could take that and actually pay it forward and really work with individuals who feel that sense of, yeah, I, I feel like I'm a high achiever. I feel like I've got a lot going for me, but for some reason I'm either on autopilot, not really engaged in my life, or I just feel trapped or stuck and I don't really know what's going on. And really what we've realized is a lot of that are limiting beliefs or false beliefs holding us back, which don't allow us to move forward. So that's really the work that I enjoy doing with people is how do we uncover that, reveal that? And then it's not about psychoanalyzing it like you might in therapy. It's about recognizing this is where I'm at right now. I can accept it. I acknowledge and accept it. What are my aligned actions to move forward to where I actually want to go? That sounds um, super relatable to everybody because I know that we all obviously have our own um, difficulties we have to work with. But uh, for me, myself, uh, and by the way, this is the first time we're getting to, to speak to one another in this setting. So to give you a little bit of background, I also consider myself a people pleaser. Um, you know, you always give to others before you, you give to yourself. And it's like the uh, example of the airplane. I was flying quite a bit over the last couple of months, mm -hmm. and especially with the COVID masks, having to wear those. You know, whenever the masks drop down, the one thing they always tell you is you need to put the mask on yourself before others. Um, I, I'm yeah. assuming there's got to be some kind of, relation between, you know, taking care of yourself and allowing yourself to flourish to be able to give more to others? Absolutely. You know, so it's funny. Um, I, I joke and I say that I'm a recovering people-pleasing perfectionist. <laughs> I, by the way, I love the way I that actually, you said that. <laughs> I actually think that people-pleasing can act, be a strength. I think that my mm -hmm. empathy is a strength mm -hmm. of mine. It's when we lean a little bit too far into it that it then starts holding us back. So to your point of giving to others, always before yourself, what happens is, is we start to lose track of our own needs and our own wants. And so the way that I really frame it for my clients is it's actually a selfful proposition, not a selfish one, to take a look at what your needs are, what your feelings are, and you know, really identify those so that when you are engaged in relationship with others, you are coming from that complete place and not looking to either fill yourself up from those other external sources, or for instance, you're feeling less than, and so you're not able to fully engage with the other people in your life. So how do you kind of draw a line? Because I, I would assume um, that you got to set some kind of boundary for yourself. I mean, we always set boundaries for others, but I feel like maybe we mm -hmm. tend to fail to set boundaries for ourselves. So where do you draw that line? How do you know you're giving too much um, at a certain point? Actually, a really great question because um, – it, it's hard, you know, we, we, we normalize, especially as people pleasers, we normalize giving. And when you're setting a boundary for yourself, it's actually slowing down and asking the simple question of, you know, do I want to say yes, for instance, mm -hmm. do I actually want to do this? Or does, is this coming from a place of, I should do this, 
Because when we look uh, at the words, I should, many mm-hmm. times underneath it, I would say it's rooted in fear. And mm-hmm. when it's, I should do this for somebody else, is it a fear that they will abandon me or they not like me or love me enough because I'm not giving to them? So when we're able to slow it down and ask ourselves, why am I saying yes? And do I really want to say yes? That is a way to hold ourselves accountable to setting our own personal boundaries. Interesting. Um, so obviously my, my goal for this conversation is really related to the, um, the leadership aspect that, that, that you do cover and talk about business. So it's obviously a set schedule, um, you know, social networking platform. There's going to be a lot of our listeners that are going to be, well, how do I relate this to my profession and, and my business, right? Um, and in mm-hmm. one, you know, one aspect of in sales and, and in just in business in general, um, you know, we are driven by our fear. So how do you take this, you know, emotional kind of, actionable fear and say, well, this is, well, the opposite, take this emotion and, and turn it into some kind of actionable steps that you're going to take in order to improve your, the quality of life. It, you know, it's really interesting because I find a lot of times people think that business and personal are two separate things. And being a serial entrepreneur myself, one of the things that I had to learn very quickly was that they're one, right? The relationship mm-hmm. with self is the thing that affects us either whether we're running our own business or just in the professional arena, if we're working for another corporation. So really what we're getting down to is when we can recognize what our emotions are, what we're feeling, recognize the the fact that our emotions are really messages telling us something that we need and allow ourselves to feel those things, allow them to actually deliver the message of what it is that we're needing. When we do that, we're actually empowering ourselves to move forward. And oftentimes in business, excuse me, in business, that's the thing that holds us back <clears throat> is the fact that we don't, we don't give ourselves the ability to recognize what our emotions are. We do not allow ourselves to source what we need, and that ends up holding us back in business. Um, an example of that is when we run our own business, for instance, if we don't deal with our own mindset issues or we don't deal with our own um, false beliefs of not being enough for instance, Mm -hmm. that can Mm -hmm. hold us back when we are trying to go out and get clients. Or if we're in the sales profession and we have this false belief in the background of I'm not good enough or um, I'm I'm a failure or whatever that mindset might be and the emotions that are associated with that, that's what holds us back. So we might blame it on the surface level I'm not good in conversation with people or I'm, okay. I get nervous talking to somebody new. That's the surface level issue <clears throat> that we deal with. Right. What really underneath that is the false belief that we're not good enough. So how does one kind of re, or maybe I'm not using the right word, but I, again, I'm speaking from my own perspective, but how does one recalibrate the brain in order to understand, well, here's my surface level and this is how I dig deeper yeah. to really understand what's going on because I do think we're very driven by our fears. I mean, um, you know, a, a lot of the things we want to do, we don't do because of the fear of whatever rejection or, you know, feeling yep. that you're, you know, you're not good enough. And, and uh, again, everybody deals with this and, and more so in business uh, for myself, at least than, than it has been in, in personal life. But how do you kind of find the underlining issue and the dig deeper? How do you get there? Truthfully, it's about taking the time to recognize where does it come from and whose story okay. is it? So a lot of times when we dig deeper, we recognize that that false belief we accumulated, it doesn't have to be a big T trauma. You know, what I often refer to my clients are these little T traumas or these little messages that we accumulate over time when we're younger, all the way through adulthood. And what happens is we internalize them and we make them mean things like I'm not good enough. Or if I fail, people are, will abandon me or leave me, right? If I fail, then everyone is going to, um, you know, think that abandonment is a big one, but if I fail, I'll get fired, whatever the fear may be. And it's about recognizing where does that story come from? And now what's actually true about me today at my current age, that could have been the false belief that I accumulated when I was 10 or when I was 13. And I did the best I could at that time. But now at the age of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, what's actually true about me? Is it actually true that I'm not good enough? Is it actually true that if I don't succeed at this one thing, my entire family is going to abandon me, right? We have to start challenging what that false belief is. And then we start taking aligned action to live in to what is actually true. 
So if the real true truth is I am worthy just merely by my essence, mm -hmm. which is my stance with everybody, we are mm -hmm. all worthy beings just because we, we are here, we exist just by our own essence. If that's actually true, what's one aligned action I can take each day to live into that truth? And like so that's that. where that work comes in is taking the time each day to take one action because small actions will compound, right? They compound into mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the bigger mm -hmm. shift. So if we take the small action each day, the living into the new truth that we're willing to accept for ourselves, that's going to compound and we're going to make that shift that you're referring to. I love that. So um, growing up, my mom um, always had this 1% rule. It's 1% better every day. And uh, I, I, it seems to me that there's some kind of resemblance in, in what you just spoke about versus the kind of the, the emotionless 1% aspect of it, which is, so how does that, and, and this is something that I did want to talk to you about is, is self-compassion. Um, uh -huh. how, it's, is there any overlap between what we just talked about and, and, and just the whole, I mean, I guess there is, and it'd be a silly question for there not to be, right? But how does that fit into this whole over, you know, overlining just idea of self-compassion? So just to give an overview of self-compassion, it's basically three, three prongs to it. One is self-kindness over self-judgment. The second is common humanity over isolation. And the third is mindfulness over versus over identification. Uh, Kristen Neff is the leading researcher on self-compassion. Okay. What we mean by self-kindness over judgment is being kind to ourselves over judging ourselves. Very often when we're trying to make these shifts, for instance, when we're trying to go from one way of showing up into a new way and we, you know, we slip or we don't do something the way that we wanted to do it, we're very quick to judge ourselves. And self-compassion calls on this, this idea of being kind to yourself, much like you would a loved one or your best friend. Right, you say, you right. know what? yes, that didn't go the way you wanted it to, or that was a slip up, but what did we learn from this? How can we move forward from this situation? So it's really, truly anchoring into kindness over judgment. The second is to recognize that you're not alone in this process. Many of us, and you said this earlier, it's a lot of us have these false beliefs and we don't even know that we have them, but it's common humanity. It's, we're not alone going through this. Other people have had similar experiences and it's okay mm -hmm. to be vulnerable with your your trusted sources and to say, hey, I could use some support. You don't have to go it alone. And then mindfulness is about being in the present moment. So often we ruminate over the past and want to you know, go back and, and fix something that happened or we future trip and worry about what could happen. And so self-compassion right. really takes us into this present moment. So back to your question of how do we make that shift? It's I'm here, I'm in this moment, and this is the commitment I'm making to myself today versus thinking about how I've done it in the past or worrying about how it's going to be, you know, a week from now. So, um, it, so if I, if I'm understanding you correctly, a lot of, a lot of what you're referring to of when it comes to self-compassion is understanding yourself, um, just as much as you would anybody else. I mean, we have this whole concept of, I, I was actually recently taking care of a dog over the weekend and I don't normally get up in the morning to make myself breakfast, yet here I am at seven in the morning taking you know, somebody else's dog for a walk and then making sure that they get fed before I go back and take my nap. So um, that right. and then the, the consciousness, I think, is, is something that um, a lot of people strive to do or think they're doing, and they don't, I guess, I guess we kind of missed the ball there. Why is, I mean, how, how do you make the, the, the conscious decision to be aware and kind of just know where you are at, at all points? I mean, that being physical or emotional, I, I guess the emotional aspect yeah. is, is something that um, I'd be more interested in. Um, you know, I've, 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 had, I've heard the line of lean into your emotions by leaning into mm -hmm. your emotions, understanding mm -hmm. your emotions and understanding mm -hmm. why it caused you to feel that way. Um, mm -hmm. can allow you to decide whether you want to do that again or you want to avoid that situation or scenario. So, mm -hmm. so how does one start to kind of really, what's the first step in, in, in being conscious about you and, and your, your emotions and, and where you are in life? My initial gut reaction to that question, the answer is willingness, right? A lot of times we have to be willing to go there. Many of us, um, again, surface level say, oh yeah, yeah, I want to do that. But really what it comes down to is how committed am I to going there? Because mm -hmm. when we say lean into the emotions, it can be scary. It can be yes. unnerving and it can yes. just be really awkward and feel just uncomfortable because yep. we've gotten really, really good at uh, putting those emotions away in a box, suppressing yep. them, putting that brave face on and you motor through. I mean, as a mom, 
I freely admit that there are days when I'm just like, I don't have time to have my emotions right now because I've got to just get through this thing for my, for my child, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there are moments when we, we just, in that moment, we react and we just, we push our feelings aside. It's how willing are we after the fact to then even go back and say, you know what, I was feeling a certain way and honoring and respecting it. And it goes back to this concept of compassion. We're so willing to do that for other people. What would it take for us to do that for ourselves? Because that's really what we're saying here is how do we bring this to our consciousness? How willing are we to actually honor ourselves and respect ourselves enough to say, what is it that I'm feeling and what is it that I need? So you've got this concept of, of self-compassion and, and what, the one word that I saw a lot of, which I thought was awesome and I had never thought about this way is, is resilience. Um, obviously mm -hmm. resilience in, in just one, you've got the, the physical resilience of grinding and putting in the time and the work, but more importantly, I think that um, that, that kind of leverages to the emotional uh, resilience, especially as, as a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, someone who's, you know, one thing is, is, is a mom, right? But another thing when it comes to, to entrepreneurship, um, although technically the more I think about it, the mom part is probably a lot more difficult than, than the, the <laughs> entrepreneurship, right? Um, but but how does, how does self-compassion play um, into this building resilience? It is such an integral part. So if we were to think of resilience, um, an analogy would be um, the level of water, right? And we ourselves are a boat floating on water. Okay. And as our resiliency level comes back or starts to steep, right? We start to lose that resiliency level. The boat itself will eventually crash. And so we ask ourselves, how do we raise that level of water? How do we raise oh. the resilience, the ability to bounce back? And self-compassion is such an integral part at raising that water level. Because as we are compassionate to ourselves, as we are kind to ourselves, or even just being mindful and being in the present moment, we're naturally raising our ability to, um, to bounce back from a situation. Because when we think about it, what happens is, and what really depletes our resiliency is when we are stuck in fight or flight, or we're in that stress level, that overwhelm for a long period of time. And so what happens is, is that water level decreases. So how do we raise that? Well, by through self-compassion, we're actually allowing ourselves to be kind to ourselves rather than judge water level goes up we're asking for support you know being vulnerable with the people around us who we feel safe with water level goes up being in the present moment water level goes up so all of that helps increase our resiliency and what we're actually doing in context is we're coming out of that fight or flight stage through self-compassion we're coming back into the self out of the um, survival mode out of overwhelm and so then we're able to continue to to move forward with whatever challenges in front of us so help me understand this a little bit um i'm a salesman or i'm a you know an entrepreneur and, and obviously my goal is to sit in front of as many prospects and possible clients and i go through you know my day and i get my first five no's of the day um mm -hmm. how you know w what mindset can i should i have and what characteristics do I want to kind of work towards in order to build this resilience that, again, it's more for me than just getting past the first five no's, right? That's one, one resilience of, of getting the no's is one thing. But how do I start to sure. take that and flip it to building my, my ocean so that, you know, I'm constantly mm -hmm. never going to hit rock bottom? You have a choice, right? <clears throat> when you get those no's, it can be, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with me, which would be judgment. I totally mm -hmm. messed up. I didn't do what I needed to do. Judgment. Or when we're building that water level, it's, oh, wow. Okay, so what did I learn in that conversation? Uh, what can I take from that no? So it's not about the no. Instead, it's a shift and a reframe of what did I take? What did I gain? So it's about, about me more than anybody else. Absolutely. It's not, it's a, and that's why I say everything comes back to a relationship with self. I see. Because when we really unpack it with that no, we have an opportunity to either make that no mean something about us as a person. I'm not good enough. I can't succeed at this salesmanship job. Or I can say, oh, how can I grow through this? Mm -hmm. Right? Again, both ways are relating to ourselves, but it's, are, am I internalizing it making me bad and wrong? Or am I internalizing and say, wow, I'm on this trajectory to, to next, grow yeah. and evolve. And really, when we come down to it, that's truthfully what we're trying to do is continue to grow and evolve. I mean, it's it's part of anybody, uh, I mean, in, in life in general, but let, even more so as an entrepreneur. I mean, we, we learn from our mistakes, and uh, I think the the good from the greats are those that 
turn around and say, well, how can I do this better? Again, even if it's 1% better this time than next time, how can I make sure I don't make that same mistake and, and learn from this situation? So uh, I really like that. I really like that. And I never, again, one thing that I love about, about the speaking with so many different um, uh, experts in, in their own fields is you hear the concepts over and over again, but everybody has their own way of kind of presenting it or puts their own spin on it. Yeah. And um, I think for me, um, the whole concept of water um, makes a tremendous amount of sense. If I'm that boat, really depends on, on, on my resilience and how much I can constantly grow my, I guess, the depth in which I'm, I'm kind of exactly. um, I'm sitting in um, than mm -hmm. it is more of a, well, can I push through the next checkpoint? That's, yes, exactly. Because you can only push so much, right? Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, so how do you take all of this and translate this to being, you know, what you call a self leader? Um, you know, we all want to be leaders in life, and we've had this conversation of leaders and, and, and management. And I don't, I don't, I don't see too much relevance in 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 that with what we're talking about in the sense of leading people versus managing people. And me, for me, what I'm starting to understand, I guess, the self leadership is the leadership about me. It's right. It's my internal leadership that I can kind of gauge and grow and lead the different components of my life in, I guess, the trajectory that I want. So how does one become a self-leader? And, and I guess more importantly, before you even answer that, what does that even mean being a self-leader to you? Being a self-leader is about, uh, you know, the relation. It's all about the relationship with self, but self-esteem, self self-confidence, and then uh how we talk to ourselves, the self-talk, if you will. Mm -hmm. And those three pillars will help us become a self-leader. Through self-leadership, then we can become a leader within our organization. If I were to, um, again, an analogy or metaphor rather, is I feel that the self-leadership is the foundation. And from there, you can grow the house, like, or from there, you can build the house, right? So <clears throat> from being your own self-leader, your behaviors can then be addressed in terms of your own personal behaviors as well as your relational behaviors. And from that place, now we can get to the roof of the house, which is essentially the goals that we're setting maybe for our team or for our company or for whatever it may be within the workplace. So okay. I do feel that self-leadership is related to leadership in general, but it starts okay. at home. It starts at home first. And so in order to be a self-leader, it is about how do I talk to myself? How do I see myself? How do I respond to myself? What is all of, what is that internal dialogue? And how do I, um, you know, truthfully, it, it really comes back to the relation with self. How do I mm -hmm. carry mm -hmm. myself from that place? Because once I really develop that ability and I can recognize my own worth and my own value and what's true about me, now I'm no longer prisoner to external validation. So by becoming a self-leader, I'm no longer de dependent upon somebody else telling me you're doing a good job or, oh my gosh, you know, yes, you can, you can do X, Y, Z at your company. Instead, it's, I have the self-belief that I'm capable of doing that. So from that place, I can now step into those leadership roles from a professional level. So do you see a lot of, I guess, successful entrepreneurs, CEOs, you know, executives having this kind of mindset and characteristic? You know, what's interesting is I think that what they have, a lot of the ones that I've actually worked with um, have done what I used to do, which is believe that my um, perfectionism or the negative talk is the thing that catapulted me forward. Okay. And what it is, is that does move you forward to a point, but then you plateau. And so that's where I've seen the growth area for a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs and the people in the C-suite, so to speak is mm -hmm. to shift into this place of relationship with self, the self-leader, letting go of being prisoner to the external validation and coming back home to self because then they can take their career even further. So, you know, without it, you absolutely can move forward. It's not that at all. It's at what point do you become? It's a different level of intensity of growth uh, in, in a sense. And it's interesting, the, mm -hmm. the whole, um, the again, analogies, always work for people generally right and and their whole roofing concept is i guess an inverse of what most people are used to when setting goals first you set your goal and then you kind of reverse engineering or what are the steps i need to take in order to get to where i want to get to and you seems like there is some you can do that but really in reality Absolutely. when it comes back to it it just falls right back to to you so would you say 
in in I guess in this realm that we're speaking, th- it all starts. I mean, you want to start working yourself before you kind of put the roof on the house, or do you need to know where you want to where you want to be going. or yeah where you're going before you start to even make those steps? I love that question, and I think I w- I would look at it in two ways. One. You never go build a house without having a design, right? So why not right. set those goals? Right. Okay. Absolutely okay. set the goals. Okay. Except then you always, once you have the goals, you can't just go build the thing. You've got to start with setting that setting The groundwork, the foundation, so and the I basement. Yeah. I do absolutely set the goals because you have to have an idea of where you want to go. What brings you joy? What is the thing that you really want to accomplish? Mm-hmm. And then give yourself that time and grace to make sure that that foundation is really solid because it would be a shame to go and just throw that house up and then have all of this, have all these cracks and not be totally <laughs> solid. And then everything comes down. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I understand. Um, so Governor, I mean, we've spent, we spent all this time in talking about, and, and there's so much more to talk about, but now I want to get to the point where it's all right. So, you know, um, I'm ready, you know, I've, I'm putting in my work. I'm ready for all this. What's my first step. What's the first thing I want to do in order to really start to make a solid effort in you know self compassion and self leadership and really taking this you know these concepts and putting some kind of actionable item to step one. I would say the very first thing that I have seen time and time again, especially with the professionals that I've worked with, is it comes down to re realigning with right. They've always been there, but it's realigning and rediscovering what your own core gifts and values are. Like what mm-hmm. are those core strengths? What are those core values? Oftentimes what ends up happening is we either take on the values of our parents or the family situation that we grew up in, or as we get into the workforce, we lose track of what are our, what are my values and what are my strengths because we are chasing. We're constantly paying reactor to things that are happening. And really what we're trying to do is get each individual into this generative mode, you know, really knowing who they are so that they can then become generative with where they want to go. So the very first step is rediscovering and realigning with your own strengths, your own gifts and your own values. And from that place, it's, it's all, you know, then you're on, you're on your way, right? You've started reigniting with that. And then it is about recognizing where some of those false beliefs might be lingering in the, in the background. And it's about, again, not, it's not, this isn't therapy. So it's not like, let's go psychoanalyze it. (laughs) I I totally believe in therapy. So just as an aside, but this is about, if I really want to help myself move forward, it's what could be holding me back? What are those limiting beliefs? Bring them to the awareness, acknowledge and accept that they're there, and then start taking those small aligned actions to move yourself forward. I like that. Um, how important is, in, in your opinion, how important is writing this stuff down rather than just kind of going through it in, in your head? So vitally important. Um, I think what happens when we do not allow that output channel, our brains need an output channel. Mm-hmm. And when we don't allow it and we're just thinking it, we're just continuing that spiral and that rumination. So it's really important to allow the time to write it out. Let it, let it have its own relief that's outside mm-hmm. of here. Because the more that we keep it in here, the more it keeps spinning. And the whole point of this is we've got to let it out and allow ourselves to almost see it. Because a lot of this work is step into observer mode, right? And see, right, oh, wow, right, that's, right. that's what I was doing. Okay. And again, it's not with judgment. It's just to understand, okay, that's how I was showing up. What do I want to change? And when you keep it all in here and you're just having those internal dialogues, it's very easy to lose track. Yeah. Yeah, re-journaling is something that I recently um, picked up. Uh, well, it's probably been about a year now where um, at night, just whatever comes to mind mm-hmm. and I put it down. And it's been something that's helped out tremendously, um, let alone being able to sleep a lot sooner than I normally would yeah. because, you know, you're able to take everything that goes on your head and put it down. Like, Well, I mean, again, that goes exactly what we just talked about is the release. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we can go through it five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in our head. Uh, but once you put it down on paper, it's something about – for me, uh, and computers, obviously, you know, in this day and age, yes, we work and you got to put stuff on a computer. But um, for me, journaling on a, with a pen and paper um, is something that I think has allowed me to kind of really be c- more conscious of what I want to look at and maybe take steps adjusting. You know, it's funny you say that because um, all of my kids textbooks are now online yep. and I, I fight tooth and nail over it I'm like where is the textbook I need to write it down and so anytime I'm helping them with something I still go get a piece of paper and a pencil I'm like let's start at the beginning uh, and let's write all this down 
Yeah, I mean, technology has changed quite a bit, and, and it's definitely helped uh, in in more more ways than not. But I think in in I'm still that old school textbook and and pen and paper um, kind of student. I, I need to have it in front of me, written down, so that I can yeah. erase things because you know you make the mistake, so cross it out and say that's not what I meant, yeah. and I meant this instead. So exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is this is something that that. Um, I, I came up across it in in your on your on your website and some of the, some of what I've read. I don't remember exactly where it came up, but the difference between codependency and um, mm -hmm. interdependency. What mm -hmm. are they, and why is it so important in in, in your mind? Codependency is um, so. I'll give you yet another metaphor <laughs> or another picture, if you will. Uh, codependency. If you think of uh, two people as circles, codependency is the equivalent of them being one on top of the other. Interdependency okay. are two circles, and it's almost like they're creating a Venn diagram. So each circle, you can still see its own individual space, and then there's this one piece that's the, the overlapping piece, right? So it's the Venn diagram. The reason why this is so important and the difference is so important is codependency is really when we lose sight of who we are in deference to the other person. Uh, it becomes, going back to we us lose our identity, <laughs> right? We lose the, the identity. And interdependence and interdependent relationships, why that would be where we would try to head is because each person still has their own identity. They're still mm -hmm. able to identify their own needs and wants. And then there's this section that's overlapping, which is the us. And I find that a lot of times, especially people pleasers, will end up in these codependent relationships because they become, it, it, it's all about wanting to make sure the other person's happy. But when mm -hmm. you lean, again, you lean too far into that, what ends up happening is that identity gets lost in the other person. And what ends up happening with codependency is you do end up without boundaries. You end up maybe with some toxic relationships um, and just, you know, again, losing, losing the sense of self. And so interdependency is about finding that healthy balance, making sure you still know who you are and what your needs and wants are. And in the workplace, this is really important too. We can build codependent relationships with coworkers and or even managers or, or supervisors. And then what ends up happening is if one of those people moves on, we feel we feel we lost, lost right. in the dynamic right. of the workplace. Right. And so right. it doesn't just have to be romantic relationships at all. It can absolutely affect workplace relationships, friendships. It can be parent-child. It happens all, all across the map. So – Naturally, the next question is, well, how do I kind of, but how do I determine whether it's a codependent or interdependent rela relationship? So this really does come back to, um, you know, <laughs> the funny, the way that I describe this in, in uh, like personal relationships is how many times do you get asked what you want for dinner? And your answer is, I don't know, what do you want? Um, that's generally a good sign that you are not able to speak up for your own needs or okay. your own wants, right? And that sounds really ridiculous to use that as the example, but it's just, it when you're in a codependent relationship, even something as simple as what do you want for dinner? It's like you lose track. You almost, it's like, well, what do you want? Like, so, how, you know, so, how would, just... so, so how would, and I want to stick to that, that, that topic. Yeah. So how would it in interdependent, I guess, conversation go instead of, well, you know, what, what we just discussed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might sound something like, I would really like um, Italian food tonight. What were you thinking you wanted? And now uh, we have a dialogue around it. Because now we're at least, you know, okay, given, let's give the fact that maybe you really don't care what you have for dinner. Mm -hmm. But if your answer mm -hmm. all the time is, is I don't know whatever, what you right. want, that would be an indication. And it's like the ever, it's a slight indication, but it's an indication that you're constantly deferring to the other person versus being able to say, I, you know, uh, or let's say your partner says something like, I really want some Chinese food. What do you think? And your answer is, I guess that's fine. When in fact, Chinese food leaves you with not an upset stomach, being able mm -hmm. to say, oh, honestly, that doesn't, it doesn't sit well with me. What do you think about this? Right. Mm -hmm. Being able to speak up for your mm -hmm. own needs and wants. So in, in business, um, how detrimental is it to being a codependent kind of, uh, I guess, team with a, with a team member, being a codependent mm -hmm. you know, relationship? Um, and let's start there. How, how detrimental is it? Because I think one thing that, you know, we could talk about it all day long, but putting an actual perception to how things can be different if you were to change these relationships um, sure. is really what helps people be like, all right, it's time for me to Absolutely. take some kind of action. So, so 
Yeah. How does that, how do you do that? So in a workplace relationship, a codependent relationship can actually keep you from moving forward in your own career um, trajectory or your own pathway that you want. Goes back to the start point of of us, right? Exactly, exactly. Because in the workplace, if I'm dependent upon, um, you know, what my coworker is doing and I'm codependent Mm -hmm. on them, if they suddenly, they find a new job and they leave, now I'm completely lost because I actually don't know what I want to do because all of my work product was dependent upon them telling me what to do. Yeah. Okay. Does that, does that, that makes that, I mean, I mean, mean, it's just that I know that I'm on the right page. I mean, it'd be like if, you know, if, if my processes rely, I'm relying on somebody else to tell me how to work my processes because they're one part of it. Now they go away. Well, my whole entire protocol of my, you know, my operational protocol just crumbled and now I've got no, you know, guidelines or guidance at all. So dependent upon them to tell me all of that, I don't feel like I can depend on myself to go figure out how would I re- how would I restructure this now that mm-hmm. that person is no longer mm-hmm. here. That mm-hmm. would be an example of how codependency in the workplace could keep could us stuck you. and stagnant. Mm-hmm. So again, naturally going with the conversation, um, how do I start to change that? I mean, I can identify those, right? Those are fairly easy to identify. And I don't think people need help with that. They might need help with, with willing to put that tag or that name on that relationship, yeah. right? But, but you, you could fairly quickly, <laughs> fairly easy identify yeah. that. So I identify it. Now what? How do I start? Again, I, I'm assuming it all starts with me and making mm-hmm. that consciousness and willing. Yeah. But again, yeah. we talk yeah. about fears and how fears stop us from moving forward. Yeah. And one of the fears is, well, maybe my teammate is not going to want to work with me if I start to you know, input my, you know, my desires or needs or wants. What you just said is actually really powerful. It's maybe they're not going to want to. So what it comes down to is instead of assuming, it's about starting open, compassionate dialogue with our teammates okay. and then reestablishing our own autonomy. Recognize, okay. okay, so at work, what is it that I want and need? And now let me find a way to communicate with my coworker, for instance, or mm-hmm. my teammate that mm-hmm. what, I'm no- what I'm noticing about me is x y and z Uh, and what i'm needing to do is a b and c i see now it's not about the other person we're not it's the me not you conversation (laughs) but legitimately the me (laughs) right right (laughs) right right Right. (laughs) but it really is it's about making sure that we're not putting you it's not there it's it's really problem right shown up in a way that created a codependent dynamic Yes, there's two people in the dynamic, but I'm taking ownership of my part because that's all we have control over is how right. we show up. So in that realm, now making taking back that power and saying, okay, how do I want to shift? And then being open to the communication with my team member, because it's not about just shifting in, um, in almost like in a silo, right? We don't want to be quiet and covert about it because then the other person <laughs> has no idea what we're doing to the, to the, to the fear of right. they're not going to want me to do that. Right. Instead, it's like, oh, I'm noticing this about myself and what I'm mm-hmm. noticing that I'm needing to do is A, B, and C and having dialogue about it. Um, and really what, it, what that does is it steps into that empowered place and rather, again, we're stepping into being generative rather than being reactive. And what I love about this is um, it translates so much to working with prospects and working with clients uh, because that dialogue and that conversation of no, not I don't want to say no, you're wrong, but here's how I want you to think of it differently. If we could do that with ourselves, well, let's start this. If we can't do it with ourselves, there's no way we'd be able to do it with, with someone else. But I think once we start to do it with ourselves, you know, your, 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 your depth of ocean starts to grow. The confidence level goes up and being able to express what you want um, definitely helps with that whole self-compassion and feeling good and being able to be responsible for yourself. And then again, that translates to and I've seen it with, with me and, and a lot of my, 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 my colleagues, they start to really manage and handle the conversation with prospects or clients or somebody else mm-hmm. we're working with in a very different way. And they take ownership of their sides and the growth comes. And uh, mm-hmm. so speak on that. How can people expect to see change in their business or in their day or even in their personal relationships with their, their husband or wife or their kids? How does that dynamic change? So it's a very interesting thing, but when we start shifting that relationship with self and we're showing up and seeing ourselves differently, people mirror that back to us. Mm. So we're showing up to a conversation with the internal dialogue of I'm not good enough or I'm going to fail at like, for instance, this prospect conversation. Mm -hmm. 
that mm-hmm. gets mirrored back to us. I talk a lot about this with people who are struggling in relationship patterns because what happens is, is they're showing up with that that relationship with self and all people are doing is mirroring that back to us. So when you do this work and you and you shift these things for yourself, what ends up happening is pe- people are responding to that and they start mirroring that same thing back to you. And that's really the the secret sauce of this whole thing and why I say it all <laughs> comes back relationship with self because we don't have control i mean i would love to i'm a control freak i would love to say i have control of all the things and all the people we don't i mean the truth is we don't all we have control over is you know how we show up and how Mm -hmm. we choose to react and respond and we can take ownership of our part in the dynamics whether they be workplace relationships personal relationships it doesn't matter it's how am i showing up how am i making what am i making this mean you know really truthfully what it comes down to is we're one thought away from a breakthrough or one thought away from a completely different way of showing up because thoughts re- thoughts will lead us to certain feelings which lead us to actions and right. results. emotions create so if action. we recognize right. right if we if we just shift the thought which we have the power to do you know it's and it's not here's the thing and i and i'm very particular about this it's not about saying you can't have a thought or don't have that thought because you're still giving it energy you're still giving it attention when you try to chase the thought away it's recognizing i'm having yeah. the thought that x and instead of then focusing uh, on that, it's like, and what else? So, right? that's, so it's not about, let me push that away. It's, and what else? So that's the willingness that you were referring to is being conscious of, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's, the consci- it's being conscious of whatever that emotion or whatever, whatever just came, that thought that it is that came to you, be conscious of it rather than mm-hmm. just reacting to it, decide the action you actually want to take. Yes, it's like um, an example is, you know, oh, that prospect just said no. I'm a, I suck at my job, right? The event is the prospect said no. The thought is I am terrible at this. Oh, right. I'm having the thought that I'm terrible at this. And what else, right? And now we make room for another thought. And then we put our focus and energy into that <laughs> other possible accessible thought because we have control over which one we're going to pay attention right, to. Right, right, right. So um, it's very interesting. So because they, they teach you in, in, in sales and in general, it's you don't use the butt. Yes, I can, but, and. right? And said to use Anne, and, and it's funny because our CEO, um, Udi, um, was going around uh, a couple of months ago and was a big advocate. And if you, the word but came out of your mouth, he was done. He would shut out and be like, go outside, come back in and try again. Um, so the whole, the, and it did make a change. And I guess I'm now, the first time I'm actually thinking about how the whole change did occur, but it, it, t- it changed the dynamics of the office. Um, where we all started kind of appreciating and wanting to communicate a little bit more because the word but kind of is like, eh, I'm going to hear you out, eh, but not fully, right? Um, and that's the whole, you know, the, the, the objection handling and the sales rebuttals if we, if we go yeah. down that route. Um, but but that's uh, it's a very interesting concept. And the, again, what I love about these, these mindsets, other than the fact that, I mean, Obviously, it's just part of, of what we do here, and we, we enjoy speaking to experts in, in different fields. I think uh, for me, personally speaking, selfishly, it puts a different perspective and a different spin on things that I've heard but haven't fully understood. And I think the more you hear something, the more you speak through something, um, going back to your point, which we've talked about, the more you speak through something in general, whether it's internally or on, you know, externally through, through therapy or, or with yourself on, on mm-hmm. pen and paper, um, you really start to kind of digest things differently. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, the whole narrative of what you're speaking about does change, I think, as you progressively, you know, grow in, 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 in self-awareness um, and self-consciousness and self-compassion, the mm-hmm. dynamic in your internal conversation changes as well. Yes, yes. And small side note on that, uh, there's a, it's a parenting secret too. If you use and instead of but, you'll get further with your teens. <laughs> so it, it's so funny you say that. Um, we talked about the what, what is it that you want for, for dinner. Um, and one thing that we, we, we teach in sales classes is uh, alternative choice, which is it's not do you want, it's do you want this or that, right? Um, and, and one of the examples is, well, do you want broccoli or do you want asparagus for, for right? Um, and um, the CEO's daughter goes, well, daddy, am I going to have ice cream or a popsicle? Um, and she's learned how that works and she does a pretty good job getting what, what it is that she wants. Um, and the point of that was in, in relationship as well, that has worked with, you know, deciding, helping, helping the significant other decide 
what we're going to go have for dinner that, that night. Do you want this or do you want Thank that? You. It at least gives them a, you know, a choice. And um, I love it. Um, we learned a lot today. I mean, uh, really, I think uh, a lot of this can be, you know, you know, what I love about this is a lot of this can be translated to professional, um, but even more so in personal. And, and again, now that we talked about it um, within yourself, and I think that uh, the more we talk about it, the more I realize it is all about the way I speak about myself is how other people are going to mirror um, speaking to me. And, and uh, I think that's a very, very, very powerful concept and tool that most people, I don't want to say don't realize, but tend to forget uh, because there's just mm -hmm. so much going on. Yeah. And to that point, um, a lot of people will want to deal with the surface level, right? Especially with yeah, business. Yeah, it's business. easier that way, right? I want to get, I wanna get to <laughs> age, like this place in business. And it's about, yes, and we can get there by going a little bit a deeper. Little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, any final Absolutely. words that you can leave off uh, the listeners with? Um, I think my final words are, it's about what, two things. One, it's about shifting from reaction to being generative. That's number one. And number two okay. is always think about how can I grow through this? Um, I think in life, we sometimes get stuck in, oh my gosh, this is happening to me. And mm -hmm. it's a shift mm -hmm. to this is happening for me. So when we ask ourselves, how can I grow through this? It's a way to Im it really utilize self-compassion and also continue that, that growth process. So I want to give you a little bit of plug uh, towards the end here because we didn't really speak much about the authentic me, um, and 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 obviously that's one of the, the authentic me rise up program, right? Um, I should full mm -hmm. full full uh, title. Um, if I if somebody were were interested in, in learning more, how do they start engaging with you? How do they get connected with you and and um, start to get involved in, in maybe you know really really diving into some of these difficulties or, or friction points that they want to kind of work on this the self compassion that they would want to work on. If they want to reach out to me, my website is commonywood.com or I'm on Instagram and Facebook with both uh, on those platforms with the handle It's Authentic Me. Awesome. Well, Kamini, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. And, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, the listeners really take at least one action today that they wouldn't have because of listening to you and um, what you've, you know, the, the information that you put out there today. So thanks again. Really, really appreciate it. 